Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The, the most interesting number for me would actually be turnout. Um, as we were walking back from the polling station last night, I said to my wife that this was the first time since I became politically engaged, which came, I've got to be honest with you, a little later in life than perhaps it should have done. I was far too busy <laughs> pounding the showbiz beat in early adulthood. But since becoming properly immersed in British politics, this is the first time I can remember making my way to a polling booth without any real idea of what would constitute a good result from my point of view. And I suspect that that describes quite a lot of people. Uh, you have the inevitable attempts today to paper over the cracks that both parties have showed at the ballot box. Um, a government with some of the scars on its reputation that Theresa May's recently endured should have done a lot worse, I think. And that means the opposition should have done better. But how dare you blaspheme against the messianic status of the modern Labour Party? It, it appears, if I want to put something out there cautiously, on which perhaps we can all agree, it would appear that hurling abuse at anybody currently unpersuaded by the magnificence of Jeremy Corbyn didn't actually persuade that many floating voters to... to plump for Labour. Who would have thought it? That, that, you know, why don't you just F off and vote Tory would not encourage people to stay on side and vote Labour. Um, people trying to cast it as some sort of success, I, I don't know how to put this politely, don't know much about history. I think it was about 1,800 gains in 1995. I don't think you can compare the elections like for like in terms of what seats were being fought for and what those results therefore mean. But if you're really trying to suggest that 40 constitutes a victory, when in 95, Tony Blair's um, resurgent Labour Party notched up about 1,800, you probably need to get your head examined. <sighs> Here's the thing. I, I, I don't know how many of us there are. How many are there out there like me? I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I, it, it would be very difficult for me to vote for the Conservative Party at this point in British political history. I would ordinarily expect to be voting for the Labour Party, um, particularly given things that I care about with regard to equality and, and, and fairness and seeing the Conservative Party's attitude on issues like Grenfell and Windrush. But I don't think people cast their votes yesterday. On the national issue, the number I'm most interested in is turnout. And the only number I can find at the moment is 37%. Which means, theoretically, we shouldn't even be talking about it today. It's a case for arguing that it was a complete waste of time and money to even have this election. Almost nothing has changed. Jeremy Corbyn had to go all the way to, was it Plymouth or Portsmouth? Oh, no, I always get those two mixed up. I've got a proper mental block on it. It was Plymouth, of course. I knew that. I was just doing a little bit of showbiz. Jeremy Corbyn had to go all the way to Plymouth to make a speech which effectively said, we have not held power here for well, two years, mate, actually. So even that doesn't exactly constitute a major sea change to the political landscape. I wrote in November of last year, I wrote, it was on Twitter, does that count as writing? I wrote, I wrote in November of last year that Jeremy Corbyn had peaked. I didn't write it with a sense of glee or, or, or um, uh, expectation. It just struck me that this this wasn't, going to get much better. It was, it was as good as it was going to get. And part of the reason for that, very simply, was that the environment for people like me, who would lean more towards the Labour Party, certainly like almost all of Jeremy Corbyn's policies, as indeed does the public, things like the nationalisation of utilities and railways, um, a, a fairer redistribution of wealth, more investment going into um, social projects, housing. The policies are incredibly popular with the public if you dig into the polling. Almost every policy that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell have um, published are individually very popular with the public, but he isn't. And for that needle to move, the people who love him needed to be really, really nice to the people who didn't. For that needle to move, you needed to put your arms around the shoulder of a so-called centrist or a moderate or a, or a borderline neutral or a floating voter or a Blairite, I don't know what you want to call them, but you needed to put your arm around her and you needed to explain to her why this path would lead to all the things that she wanted. And I think, at risk of over-egging 
the pudding. I think that um, yesterday showed it hasn't happened. It simply hasn't happened, and it probably won't. So what happens? Here's the really weird thing, and, and I'd quite like you to ring me on this, even though it's an odd one and we don't normally do sort of nebulous theoretical politics, but today I'm going to because, in a way, the actual results are quite boring. The actual results, as I said a moment ago, apart from the collapse of UKIP, but even that's not very interesting because, of course, they've gained overall control of the Conservative Party, so their disappearance from various councils up and down the country is, is hardly going to be a cause for mourning in reactionary and racist elderly households. They're not all going to be looking at the result and go, oh, no, UKIP's gone. They're going to be looking at Downing Street and saying, do you know what, despite all those initial... Um, fears. I think that Theresa May is one of ours. Look look at the way she's handled the Windrush thing, sending all these innocent people to prison. It's, it's magnificent. I like her. Innocent black people. So the collapse in the UKIP vote doesn't really speak of anything particularly significant. Everything else has stayed more or less the same. A good night for the Liberal Democrats. Um, a better night for the Liberal Democrats than Labour, if you're still trying to argue that Labour have had a good night with their 37 uh, increase. Um, Liberal Democrats are up by 40. Conservatives have lost two. Greens have gained six. UKIP currently stand uh, having lost 92. Divvied up fairly equally then, looking at the numbers between everybody else. But this, and I could have got this wrong, this, for me, is the really interesting question. And it's up to you whether or not I have to withdraw that opinion by 11 o'clock today. For me, what I really want to know is whatever your politics... What would have constituted a really good result for you? <clears throat> because, and this is the slight danger in framing the question this way, I can't think of one. Shall I tell you how I voted? No, I better not. I'll tell you this, right? I had three votes in my ward. I voted for three different parties. Each one of my votes went a different way. It's a secret ballot, so I'm not going to tell you which, which they were. And, and that seemed to me to be one step better than not voting at all. That seemed to me to be just the recognition of my responsibility as a member of the electorate. And hey, obviously I, I know quite a, a lot about the various parties and policies, and, and I did look largely as well at local issues. But as I did that, and I st stood there in the, in the polling booth feeling a little bit ridiculous, actually, but the reason was that I couldn't look you in the eye and tell you what would have been brilliant. I, I could not, and that is incredible. So, you know this theory I've got about the footballification of everything at the moment? There's a massive flaw in it that I hadn't properly identified. So, you, you, you pick a side and then you slavishly stick to it and scream horrible abuse at everybody else wearing the opposition's colours. Your, 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 your central defender hacks down their striker in the middle of the box and you scream blue murder at the referee that it wasn't a foul at all. You watch the replay and, and your striker was 14 yards offside for the winning goal but you swear blind that he wasn't offside at all. Do you know, you know what I mean by that? The, 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 the suspension of, of, of objectivity that kicks in when your devotion to any team or side is slavish, tribal, footballification of politics. And, and I love this theory, and I think it describes the discourse in this country at the moment, um, largely because of Brexit, but not wholly. It, it, it's this notion of, right, that's me, yes, right, down with all the rest of you. And that holds true for the central discourse of British politics now. But I've got a feeling, and we'll double-check that 37% figure, I've got a feeling that if there was a, a way of recording overnight how many people currently feel unrepresented it would have been the biggest number of all so can we discuss that am i right that's an easy way of doing it and it of course offers you the opportunity to embarrass me which we always enjoy am i right and i just say that probably more people felt genuinely unrepresented yesterday and you can cast your votes for minority parties and well done to the liberal democrats but more people probably felt unrepresented as they made their way to the polling booths or quite understandably decided to stay at home than felt really passionate about either of the parties of potential government. And that's really weird. I can't really remember. I, I, I mean, 83 was it, Michael Foote? I don't... I, I was barely... I was still in short trousers, practically. So that doesn't really resonate with me. It led, of course to the formation of um, 
or just prior to that, you'd had the SDP formed. I, I wonder if we're heading into that kind of period where there is going to have to be some sort of uh, realignment of, of party politics because Brexit's tearing the Conservative Party apart. All they do is keep pressing postpone on that. And the Labour Party doesn't really merit the description of being a party anymore, so disparate are its various strands. So here are two questions. Number one, what would have been really good news for you? 03456060973. And number two, am I right in thinking that more of us now feel unrepresented by the major parties in British politics than feel passionate about the prospect of either of them achieving power? Hit the numbers, you will get through. 03456060973. So, if the first question is a bit co a bit confusing. I hope it isn't, but just to clarify, if, for example, you, you, you love Labour's policies and you passionately want to see the Conservative government um, slapped from pillar to post and, and you want to see scandals such as Windrush and Grenfell really resonate and you want to see decency and fair play return to this country, then you possibly would have wanted Labour to do much worse than they did because it might have created an environment where a change at the top became inevitable. And that's really weird. What did you want to happen? I wanted the party that I kind of naturally and historically lean towards to do really, really badly. If you're going to go at it solely on the cause of Brexit, who the hell would you have voted for? You just want to stop this nonsense. Liberal Democrat? Yeah, but they're not actually going to achieve a position where they might be able to do the thing that they're the only people offering to do. Do you see what I mean? I reckon I could... I could probably talk uninterrupted between now and 11 o'clock, and by the end of the hour, there, there wouldn't be a person listening who didn't feel unrepresented. Unless you really like reactionary, kind of racist ideologies that this government has now doubled down on. So, do you feel unrepresented? What would have been the best outcome for you, personally and politically? in yesterday's election. That, that's the weirdest thing, is if you're a neutral in the context of football, it's actually really nice. You, you can watch, you know, the two best teams in the country, City playing Chelsea, without necessarily having a dog in the race and just enjoy the football. But it's the opposite when it comes to politics. If, if you feel unrepresented by the two major parties at the moment, it's a very dispiriting spectacle to watch them slugging it out and neither side obviously landing knockout blows. Um, lots of your thoughts. Sorry for going on. I'll, I'll, I'll take as many calls as we can on this subject because I suppose in a way it's the most important political conversation of them all. Sam's in Egham. Sam, um, two questions. You can pick one to answer or have a crack at both. What would have been brilliant? What would you have loved to have woken up to this morning? And um, do you, like me, feel woefully unrepresented on the national stage? Off you go. I feel um, completely unrepresented on the national stage. Um, I'm probably instinctive Labour voter. Yes. But um, the EU is my big issue, dual national. Um, all my citizenship woes came to an end in 1973, 4. Yes. I'm about your age, and suddenly we didn't have to queue at you know, Calais, Harwich, going into Germany, crossing the borders between Holland and Germany. All of those things just went away overnight. I've had that taken away. Nobody represents me all my opinions and I'd quite like to know what the three million EU citizens who are still entitled to vote in the local elections actually did because most of the people I know were going to vote for a Remain party regardless of local issues and I've always been local election, local issues, vote for the independent who's doing something about local roads. Yes. Didn't have that choice this time and voted for the only Remain so like, you voted for the Liberal Democrats in the knowledge that they are never going to I form a government? Know. I mean, I live in a really close to a university. Um, both the Labour and the Lib Dev candidates are stu current students, I think. Mm. The Tory was going to get in. I live in Surrey. It, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to at least have that. Well, that, that is, do you know, I, I, I think in probably in a truly fair universe, if everybody could leave their, their loyalties and their prejudices at the door, you, you'd have to describe the Liberal Democrats as having had a really good night, albeit that, that yes, presumably exactly. you'd like them to have done better. 
People trying to claim that, that Labour's done well despite winning zero new councils in London and a total so far of 37 seats. The Lib Dems have, have beaten them. They've got they've won Richmond and they've got 40 seats. And, and that was the one party that seemed to be campaigning at least as much on national issues as it was on local issues. So to, to, to answer question one, for you, you'd love to have woken up this morning to an absolute Liberal Democrat landslide. Well, the same kind of thing, the same kind of feeling I had in 1995 when Labour wiped out all those Tory councillors. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and and that didn't happen, and that's it's different from '95 because you wouldn't necessarily want the Liberal Democrats to yeah. go on and form a national government, not not least because we'd struggle to name half a dozen yeah, prominent yeah. Liberal Democrat parliamentarians I at the moment. Say it's the Liberal Democrats from UKIP. See, I don't like that aspect of the Liberal Democrats, but UKIP has kind of go to the Liberal Democrats. I just don't understand that. Well, that's, I suppose they've got to go somewhere. There, there was always a small number of UKIP voters who were um, comfortable with immigration. Uh, I, I think you probably need a, a, a psychotherapist rather than a journalist to examine quite what they thought they were getting out of the deal. Sam, thank you. It's a lovely start. Dina is in Maida Vale. Dina, two questions. You can answer either of them or both of them. Where would you like to start? Oh, I'd like to start with how would I like to have woken up this morning yes. with what result. And um, <clears throat> the result that I would like to have seen was the entire Conservative Party do the honourable thing um, and resign. <laughs> the, the entire Conservative Party do the honourable thing? Yeah. Did someone slip something in your tea this morning, Dina? No, I'm 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 really serious. Okay. Um, I I would lie. I'm, I think they've been dishonourable people in our history at some level. I think their approach to the poor, the ethnic backgrounds, to the disabled, has been totally dishonourable. And if they had any sense of what it meant to be called honourable. Mm. They would all have resigned as of immediate effect and done a repentance, really. You're, be, you're being very life. idealistic, and, and, I mean, people could easily... No, I'm not. Well, you are I'm being not. idealistic. I, I'm not criticising you. Idealism is a wonderful and a beautiful thing. I'd rather see more of it in the world than less. But the idea of any government, any administration, sort of collectively deciding that the shame has become too much to bear and they're going to hand back the keys to the palace is, is, is a little um, uh, unlikely. Well, I'd like them to hand the keys over. I'd like us to go into a state of emergency and hand the keys over to people like yourself. Oh, to Lord. People that, to people of, of the radio that call in to have a kind of general feeling of common sense and decency. You want a national uh, government, in other words. Yes, I'd uh, like a, na a temporary national government. With a few yes. agreed areas to focus on that, that, that wouldn't then become muddied and, and manipulated manipulated by um, uh, newspapers encouraging us all to worry about the wrong thing. So, I mean, that, that aside, in terms of what you would have... So what would have made that more likely this morning? The problem is nothing. If, if the Tories had had a nightmare overnight, it would have put Jeremy Corbyn in an incredibly strong position. And that... Well, the fact that it didn't suggests that his position isn't, isn't strong at all. Would you have faith in Jeremy Corbyn to deliver the, 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 the future you've just described? Um, it's not that I have don't have faith in him because I do personally but half the nation doesn't and I think that the only way through this uh, this horrific mess really is for us to have a national government like we have shared values when we go into society you know we've all agreed we don't just kill each other or steal from each other or mm. and if we do you know I think with some shared values of decency and what constitutes being human like decent housing safety yeah but, the, but you have to recognize and and this is a little unfair perhaps but it, it, you know the, the medium lends itself to glibness sometimes you have to appreciate that, that everyone who voted conservative yesterday doesn't prioritize the things that you do no also those but they don't prioritize with jeremy corbyn either so and we're get, we've got stalemate we've got it is, it's a, it is stalemate isn't it that's exactly what it is yeah. it, it's so bizarre to see, I, I kind of wonder what I, I understand what some of jeremy corbyn's supporters are passionate about i think that they're increasingly myopic I, i'll give you an example from courtney as soon as poor people get representation i.e corbyn middle class people rich people like at mr james ob start feeling left out it's a sad world. So, obviously, listening to a 
different radio programme from the one I've been presenting, which has pointed out that almost all of the policies that the Labour Party campaigns on prove popular with the public. E even nationalisation. Owen Jones wrote a piece a few years ago about UKIP voters actually really liking hardcore Labour policies. If you asked them what they thought about the policy and left the party and the personalities out of it. So um, I, I love the idea of redistribution of wealth, but of course in the, in the minds of the faithful, if you don't think Jeremy Corbyn is the best man to deliver it, then somehow you must be, well, what? A Zionist Tory shill? Um, who, who, it, 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 shellfish. It, it, shellfish. 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 It, so, yes. No, I hear you. I hear you. I wish you... I, I mean, who, who, who would be happy with what happened? That's another question we can look at. Colin's in Camberley. Colin, what would you like to say? Hi. Good morning, James. Hello, Colin. Um, uh, well, can I start by saying I grew up in, in council house poverty in Wales and I now own my own little house in the home county. So yes. I could be anything from, from Labour to Tory, but the only thing on my mind when I cast my vote was um, the interests of uh, remaining. Yes. And, OK, so where does that leave us? Um, the only thing I can think is that um, Jeremy Corbyn... I would like to see the back of him, for, just so Labour could go back and uh, honour its, let's say, its voters by staying Remain, let's say, champion the position of Remain. 20-odd yeah, percent of, of Labour voters at the last general election weren't Remain voters. 20% were not Remainers. Yeah, I mean, so I, I don't know what the tactic is. I'm trying to be open-minded, but the idea is that they can't afford to alienate the... The voters in the north, in the non, in the in the kind of non, the post-industrial communities, who want to leave the European Union, and if Corbyn really nails his colours to the remain in the European Union or, or or push for the sanest Brexit possible, then people who still think that that Brexit is a good idea would would be pushed away from the Labour Party. But he doesn't seem to be pulling anybody new in, does he? Either. I mean, 20% for... 20-odd percent. He means 80% remain. 70-odd, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot, and he's paying no attention. No, I know. I'm just trying to put the... In the absence of anybody from his high command ever having the decency or grace to talk to the million people that listen to this radio programme, I have to try and work out what their thinking is for myself, Colin. So, presumably, that's... Either it is a con job and they're desperate to crack on with Brexit and get out as quickly as possible, but can't afford to say that in public because then people like you could never vote for them again. Or there is some sort of waiting game going on, but no one's explained it to us, so we kind of have to speculate and take it on trust. So what would... Because you're clearly feeling horribly unrepresented. Mm. What would you like to have woken up to this morning? I would have liked... Well, I'm no Tory, although I have voted Tory in the past. Yes. But I'm not really... It's not in my heart. Um, I would have liked to have seen the Labour Party taken a beating and then a rebellion in the Labour Party because of the result of that. A leadership challenge and perhaps get a more moderate person in because... Um, well, not a, not a more moderate person because the policies are sound. It's It's just a more... What? Effective Jeremy's person. That's what you're describing, isn't it? No, uh, Jeremy's... I mean, Jeremy's a wally. He's Islington, bedsit, Rick Mayle of the Young Ones type old person. He's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's He's not the man for the job, you know. Anyone... I mean, no, but anyone. when you say moderate, that's a policy pronouncement rather than a personality pronouncement. And I, and I think now, regardless of the qualities or otherwise... We need to recognise that the modern world, like it or not, needs to see leadership. It needs to see blood on the carpet at Prime Minister's questions. It needs to see a fleetness of foot, a, a, a speed of thought, a fluidity, a loquaciousness, an eloquence, a charm, an ability to win over a room rather than just the bits of it that will be in your pocket come rain or shine. So that's why I object slightly to the word moderate, because I don't know that you have problems with any of the party's policies. You've just got a problem with the driver. I have a problem with Brexit, James. Yeah, That's my only thing. Um, I know we, you, go on, you, you talk about it a lot in the show. Can I say that Brexit, no matter how bad you think it's going to be, is going to be a thousand times worse? Um, <laughs> All I, right, honestly, Chuckles. <laughs> well, listen, James, I've, I've just spent this, this morning send, trying to send a package to Switzerland. Yes. Uh, if it was going to Germany or any other EU country, I would just post it by UPS. Yes. This morning I've had to look up tariff codes, I've had to look up VAT codes, I've had to put in declarations. 
Now, can you imagine all the businesses in the UK suddenly have to switch to that? But every country you send to, we're I don't. Die. I don't. Oddly enough, oddly enough, Colin, I don't have to imagine it because um, yeah. some of the key business people running the, the the docks and the Channel Tunnel have been sharing their thoughts on what is going to happen, and it's not a million miles away from from your predictions, actually. But I'm a little late for the news. After that, we'll return to these two questions because they're really why why are so many of us feeling unrepresented? It's not just Brexit, although that's a big part. And secondly, what would you really like? And I love this question because it, 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 it doesn't really depend upon your politics. It depends upon how hard you're thinking. What would you have loved to have woken up to this morning in, in the context of the council elections that were conducted yesterday? I don't want to hear about your love life. This is a nice question and, I, and I'm really enjoying your answers to it. What would you most like to have woken up to this morning? What, what, what result of yesterday's council elections would have somehow advanced your cause or pleased your political perspective the most? Because I can't really imagine anyone's delighted today. If you were divvying up reactions, the Conservative Party will be happier than the Labour Party because widely predicted and expected gains in London in particular for the Labour Party simply haven't happened. Um, it, of course, it, it will for some people, a relatively small but very vocal minority within the party. This will all be the fault of smear campaigns and mainstream media. It has absolutely nothing to do with the leadership of the party when they fail to perform well in an election. And that, I think, leads to the second part of this morning's inquiries, which is this curious constituency of people in Britain today who feel utterly unrepresented by mainstream parties. It's quite, quite bizarre, like nothing I can remember. Um, except perhaps a bit like when Michael Foote was in charge of the Labour Party and it prompted the foundation of the SDP. But I'm, I, I, I did it at A-level, a but that was a long time ago. Um, I can't quite remember, I'll be honest with you. 10.37 is the time. I'll just read you a quick Twitter exchange by way of... Um, well, there's two reasons for it. Number one, I, I, I'm going to name drop about someone who I think is really cool and I'm very flattered that he cares about what we think. Uh, and number two, it's a really helpful illustration of what I'm trying to articulate. So I tweeted earlier, I'm no sophologist, um, but hurling abuse at people unpersuaded of Jeremy Corbyn's magnificence doesn't seem to have persuaded many of them to vote Labour. To which Billy Bragg replies, it's a two-way street. Those of us who support Corbyn have had abuse hurled at us by the media since before he was elected. Less abuse, more constructive criticism from all corners would be helpful. To which Stan, a regular um, uh, contributor, has replied saying, I've been a member for 30 years, Bill. I saw you on Red Wedge. So how do you expect me to react when I'm constantly being told that I'm an effing Tory who should F off and leave the party because I'm not welcome? One side is defo far worse in all this. Uh, and as good an illustration as you'll find of, of just how divided, and, and that's within a party, let alone within a country. So no surprises that so many of us actually went into the polling booth yesterday with no clear idea of what a win would look like. Gosh. Yeah, that is the correct description of me. But no idea at all as I cast my votes, all three of them, what would actually constitute grounds, reasons to be cheerful in the result. 10.38, Lee is in Brentwood. Lee, what would you like to say? Uh, well, I don't I very often agree with you, James, I have to say, but on this, I'm, I'm totally with you, 100%. I, I, I couldn't bring myself to vote. Uh, I voted once, in fact, in the last 20 years. Um, I should gravitate towards the Conservative Party. Um, my wife and I run our own small businesses. Mm. But systematically, every advantage to uh, being uh, a small business owner and all the pressures and uh, time that has to go into it are being broken down. And it's the, the like uh, what, mate? What, 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 what have they done that's made your life harder? I haven't heard this well, angle before. Well, well for example, um, with tax and national insurance, it's basically you used to be, as a company director, you used to be uh, able to take a certain amount... Uh, tax-free, uh, dividends tax-free, but that's now being equalised so mm. that it's more or less on a par with the pay-as-you-earn system, uh, which is all very well if you're looking at uh, simple monetary terms, but the stresses and, you know, trials and tribulations that go into running a business, you know, 24-7, seven, seven days a week, you know, it needs to be worth it. So, to me, they're dismantling the small economy, you know, small business economy within this country, and it, it sort of lend, lends itself towards big corporates, uh, which, you know, for me, I can't stand. I, th I think they're, they're destroying the fabric of our society all over the country. It's funny, um, isn't it? Because that, that, that is arguably quite a left-wing argument, and yet you're making it very much from a right-wing perspective. So you would like, a, you would like in terms of fiscal conservatism, you, you would like, you'd like have a, a more Thatcherite approach. People like yeah, you should I, be I, free I, to I, keep more of 
your money rather than paying it in taxes. And at this point, we, we do fall out. You mentioned at the outset you don't normally agree with me because all of the people you employ need to be educated, they need to be looked after by the health service, they need to be um, brought to and from work on roads that have to be paid for, they need to be able to see at night in the dark, which is when the lights come on, and all of those things the employer should be paying more than the employee for, which is why I'm comfortable with the tax arrangements. But I, under, I understand why you're not. What would have well, been... My, a... argument, my, my argument would come back on that... Is... A small business proportionate to their income distributes more into the economy than the likes of Google. Yeah, but, but this is my point. You're looking up, and you're right to. You're comparing your scenario to Google. I'm comparing your scenario to the people you were comparing it to a minute ago, i.e. your employees who are on PAYE. So that, that's, that's, that's a simple distinction. We can both be right on that. What would have been the biggest... What would you have liked to have woken up to this morning, Lee? Oh, I would just love to see the ability to put none of the above. Uh, I know it's uh, it's a pipe dream, but... So there was no uh, result that could have actually made you feel happier? No, because I don't trust any of them. So you're naturally a conservative, but this conservative party are not doing the kind of conservatism that you like? Oh, well, and I would say that's been more or less the case since since Thatcherism, in all, in all honesty. Um, you know, we've, we've, seen, we've seen a shift too far to the... To the top of the pyramid, you know, everybody underneath is getting trodden on. But uh, this is socialism, and, uh, mate. Well, it is. <laughs> I, I, so, I a socialism I where the bosses don't pay as much tax as the workers. Well, no, 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 no. If I can, if I can explain, so what I'm saying is that ultimately, what you're looking for is that you mentioned earlier, keep more of what you earn. So, what you're looking for is a meritocracy. What I don't agree with is just universal handouts to people that aren't interested in trying to better themselves. And I think most people that sit in my political uh, position would probably see that Labour are too far that way. So they want to give everything to people that are not interested in working. But that's and just not true anymore, is well, it? That, well, I, I, you know what? Employment's at the highest it, 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 employment's at the highest it's ever been. I mean, how, how high does it have to go the, before you drop that, this rhetoric? That's on the basis of zero hours contracts. There, yeah, well, which is the only work they're being offered, mate. While you're sitting there saying that they're scroungers. Matter, but you're using, but you're using that as a statistic. <laughs> but you're I'm saying that they're scroungers. Irrelevant. It's the only work they're being offered. I, I, I didn't actually say they're scroungers. What I said to you sitting was, around doing nothing. I think you said. You're, you're, no, you're missing the point. Go on, I'm man. talking about the Labour Party, yes. not the people that I perceive that the Labour Party have an interest in. There's a fundamental difference. You're talking about who we're voting for. My argument is that the Labour would take from people like me that want to work hard and work, you know... But the tax, hours, the, tax, the tax arrangements that you just complained about the Conservatives chasing were, were, were in place for the duration of the last two Labour governments. But well, this has been going on for, as I said, going back to the, to the early... Right, just pause for a minute and uh, listen to what I said. The tax that you've just complained about the Conservative Party changing was left in place by Labour. And the point being... Well, you're now complaining that the Labour Party would do something with the tax system that you didn't like, but you're no, harking no, no, back, no, you're, you're, you're expressing James, affection. You're doing, James, you're doing what, what frustrates me when I listen to you, in that you're twisting what I'm saying. Well, no, I'm not, mate. I'm just repeating it back hand, to you. On the one hand, yes. I should gravitate towards a Conservative Party. I should be looking at them as being my natural habitat for, for my vote, OK? But, but you haven't voted. Well, you've only voted once in 20 years. Because over that last period of time, I look at I look at what they're doing, and I see that they are moving towards big corporate. Yeah. They're, 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 and your evidence for that is the changes that they've made to the tax arrangements for business people no, no, like no, you. It's not. Only, it's not only that. It's that when you come up against the challenge um, in in a certain environment, for example, if you if you end up having a, a, a dispute with your electricity provider. Um, the, the whole system, and again, you all argue this has been in place for however long, but well, it's not an argument, is it? Well, it takes away your voice. No one, people like me, have no voice. We have no one representing us when we. That's have a, a, I, I, I've taken on board what you've said, and, and it's, it's an, a, I'd love to hear from a conservative politician about the idea that you don't feel represented. That, that I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit baffled by a couple of things that you say, but I don't want to labour the point, <laughs> if you pardon well, the pun. That, you, you're, you're more than welcome to, James. As I said, it's been quite civil. Normally, you, 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 uh, you pull me down quite, quite more aggressively. But, you know, the reality is... You, you, the, the, Mate, I've, I believe... I've got to go to the break. I've understood what you've told me. I just don't know that there's ever been a party that would have represented what you've just described. Because the notion that Mar Mar Margaret Thatcher arguably did... Uh, nurture small businesses, but the idea that the, the, the kind of 
brand of neoliberalism that she's done more to introduce than any politician in the 20th century, except possibly Ronald Reagan. That's why the massive corporations have run riot. That's why they're able to operate in this country without paying in tax the same percentage of their profits that you would have to pay as a small business person. That's why the so-called globalisation of the economy that began in 1979 has left people like you hung out to dry. So I, I don't know. I can see why you haven't voted in 20 years, but I, I think you probably need to get back to the to the old history books to have a look at what Margaret Thatcher did to the international economy and the notion of governments not intervening in business. That's what Westland was all about. The idea that, that Michael Heseltine wanted the government to protect British business and Margaret Thatcher simply wanted it to be sold to the highest bidder, which on that occasion happened to be the American helicopter firm Sikorsky. It is 10.49 and you are listening to a slightly sort of becalmed and befuddled James O'Brien on LBC this morning. Calm because I couldn't really see yesterday what could happen overnight that would cheer me up about the state of British politics and befuddled because I, I genuinely and increasingly think that I'm, I'm in a majority feeling unrepresented by either of the two main parties. And that's very, very weird. It's also quite dangerous, I'd have thought, democratically. But let us concern ourselves with other matters for the moment, because today is the second Firefighters Memorial Day. I don't know if you registered um, this last year. And it is being marked today with the uh, release of a film um, explaining the introduction of the red plaque scheme. I don't know if you were listening yesterday when we talked rather excitedly about blue plaques that are put up to um, simply mark previous homes of, of people who have gone on to, to prominence. The red plaque scheme is rather more poignant. And Tam McFarlane, um, a national officer with the FBU, joins me now to tell us a little more. So what, what, what is the red plaque scheme, Tam, and how is it starting out? Well, hi, James, and thanks for having me on the programme. I mean, you just mentioned the blue plaques, and I know, you know all your listeners will be aware. You walk around London and elsewhere, you'll see these blue plaques to you know various notables yeah. up in the walls of buildings. We were very keen uh, to make sure that firefighters who'd lost their lives in the line of duty were remembered and remembered appropriately. So after a lot of thought and discussion, uh, we come up with the idea of red plaques. And the red plaques will be commissioned by, you know, firefighters who, who at stations who had worked with colleagues who died, lost their lives in the line of duty. And these plaques would be put up in appropriate areas where these firefighters had lost their lives and where, you know, their colleagues, their families and indeed the, communi the communities could go along, look at the plaque and, and remember these, the courage and sacrifice that these people had given. It's, it's fully funded, I know, by proceeds raised from the Firefighters 100 lottery. Um, yeah. And it, it follows the film release today, the unveiling of the first red plaque in honour of Billy Forst and Adam Meir, yeah. who lost their lives in Bethnal Green in 2004. Where, where has that plaque gone? Where, 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 where that, does it now sit? That's actually in Whitechapel in London itself. I mean, we released a film today just to, to show the impact that that's had. And we've got um, Billy's dad is in the film showing how much the plaque actually means to him. And I think it is really important, you know, that the, the courage of firefighters and the sacrifice of firefighters is remembered um, everywhere. We thought it was, it was vital mm. that this shouldn't be forgotten. And yeah, you're right there. We set up the red plaque scheme. It's fully funded um, by a lottery. Uh, it's the Firefighters 100 lottery and people can go on there, buy a ticket. The ticket's only £1 a week and that's at www.firefighters100lottery.co.uk and we are also rolling out the plaques across the country. We've had several approaches now from from fire stations and the families of firefighters looking to have a plaque set up. So it's something that's really taken hold and we're really pleased that it is. It's, you know, it really is so important um, that, that our people it, It's are remarkable that it way. didn't already exist. When you think of the, the, yeah. the, the prominence of war memorials in towns and cities up and down the country, the, the, the idea that someone can make the ultimate sacrifice in protection of British citizens and, and um, it's taken until 20, 2018 for the, for the scheme to be in place, but I suppose better, better late than never. We should also mention, Tam, the, the minute silence that you and your yeah. colleagues will be observing today. To, to stress, this is confined to fire stations, but it's just a, it's a moment for, for everybody in the service just to perhaps take stock of, of, of where their colleagues have gone before them. Mm. 
Yeah, and I'd ask members of the public uh, to take part as well. Look, today's Firefighters Memorial Day. It's the second year it's been run. So we run it in association with the Firefighters Memorial Trust, who's another organisation. And so members of the public will probably see today, if they go along to the fire station, firefighters stood outside at midday today, um, shoulder to shoulder, uh, in a minute's silence. Again, to remember the, the courage and sacrifice of firefighters, not just from their brigade, but from across the country. Because, you know, we've lost over 2,500 firefighters have been killed in line of duty, many more seriously injured, and we think it's absolutely vital that the courage and sacrifice of these people is remembered across the board. So yeah, um, emergency control rooms, fire stations, and other fire service workplaces will all take part in this. And again, I'd encourage members of the public, go along to your station where we, you know, we are all so connected to the community, it'd be fantastic if they stood shoulder to shoulder with us to remember people who sacrificed themselves to, to help them. And you may not say this, but also, actually, to show a little bit of appreciation and gratitude to the people who run the risk of making that sacrifice every time they turn up for work. Well, yeah, um, yeah, I suppose it's one of these strange things when you are a firefighter. I've been in the job now for 26 years. It's strange when you all sit around the table. It's one of the things you know, we, we don't talk about. I'm sure. But, you know, I'm, I'm an FBU rep, and I tell you what, it's, a, it's an incredible honour to represent um, the people. I go across the UK, talk to firefighters and see what they do. A remarkable bunch of public servants whose courage really is uh, is remarkable. I mean, I know Grenfell will be in everyone's minds. Mm. Um by the way, it's a miracle no firefighter died or was seriously injured in that fire. But it does bring into full focus the dangerous situation that um, your firefighters put themselves in across the UK and every, time, every single day. Every t yeah, exactly that. Every time you turn up for a watch for a shift, you, mm. um, you, you, you never know what's going to be at the end of that emergency call. Uh, Tam McFarlane, thank you so much for your time and for the efforts of, of course, your entire service. If you are near a fire station, uh, just pop out at lunchtime near work or if there's one near home, depending on where you're listening, you'll probably know where it is. Um, if they haven't turned it into a wagon mama, then you can uh, pop down there and, and, and show your appreciation quietly, calmly, respectfully, and, and I would add gratitude to that as well. Uh, 10.55 is the time. Two strange questions on the board this morning, but it's been a fruitful exercise. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. We'll carry on with it for a little longer after the 11 o'clock news before moving on to the issue of respect. And that may sound odd, but there are three stories today that spoke to me in a similar way. The first was that one, the, the Firefighters Memorial Day. The second involved a police officer who's had his ear bitten off and um, attributed it to a complete loss of respect for the uniform among the public. And the third is a story about teachers possibly being offered a sabbatical, a paid sabbatical, because the profession is hemorrhaging staff at, at a rate of knots and also at a rate that, unlike the NHS, hemorrhaging of qualified staff can't really yet be, well, won't be attributable to, to the Brexit vote. So the, the, the invitation from the tabloid press, if it hasn't already been issued, will be for you to abuse teachers and point out how much holiday they get and then demand that, you know, they should, you, you, you have a rubbish time at work, so they should too. The idea that we don't respect teachers is quite incredible, given that we trust them to effectively raise our children in loco parentis. We trust them with our children's lives every morning, but we don't respect them as a profession anymore. Um, similarly, firefighters, who I think still retain the respect of much of the nation, but there is, of course, anecdotal evidence of them being having rocks thrown at them when they turn up on certain estates. And the police officer talks. So I, I am going to ask you quite an odd question today, um, which is what, what, what jobs do you automatically respect? And we'll have a look at why jobs that I personally think should command respect from absolutely everybody have, have somehow lost it over the course of the last 20 years or so. Before that, back to the council elections. Trevor is in Camden. Trevor, what would have constituted the most amazing morning of your life if you'd woken up today to see the council results? Um, I think it would have been to have seen council results that had been delivered by a fully proportionally representative system rather than the archaic one that we... You have taken have. my already strained analogy and strained it to breaking point. You can only answer the question in the context of the electoral system under which we voted yesterday because you couldn't have gone to bed having cast your vote under one electoral system and woken up to results that have been delivered oh, well, by a different one. Good, 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 good point. <laughs> Let, let's say that I dreamt that then just before I woke yeah, up. Fair enough, fair enough. Good morning to you, by the way. And to you. Um, uh, yeah, well, what, what would I like to have seen? Yeah. I'd like to have seen a, a lot more people voting. That's yes. what I would like to see. But, um, but, I but voting for what? I mean, this is the central point of the second question I'm asking this morning, is that if people up and down the country feel horribly unrepresented, then that actually is the reason why they didn't vote. Well, well, 
I actually stood as a candidate. I don't know if I'm allowed to say say that now. I think we're around. You, ju you just did. Are you still alive? Uh, yeah, I just think... Check, just be quiet a second, see if anyone's banging on the door. I'll just take my pulse. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah. no you're fine. That's all right. Yeah, no consequences. Yeah. You can say that. Absolutely, absolutely fine. But I did so under the... Um, I, I, with no illusion that I was going to be elected, but I did so so that people, other people, could actually vote for their conviction. That's, um, you, you know, because it yes. wouldn't have been... Other, otherwise, it wouldn't have been there. It wasn't there necessarily to take votes from other parties but it was there to allow people to vote for what they thought might represent them and they had a you had quite a good night as a green not bad, yeah, not bad. But you, you gained done a little bit better liberal democrats probably um uh, secured a lot of votes that you might have got on a different day but but it, it possibly yeah it, it didn't change anything did it it's not it's nothing no it didn't, it didn't change much, but it, it never will until, you know... You until know, we go back to the beginning of the conversation and have that truly representative and fair electoral system. That, I think that history will judge Nick Clegg quite unkindly for that referendum um, that most of us can't even remember on changing the electoral system for something that was, as they would say in Yorkshire, neither now nor summit. It's coming up to 11 o'clock. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I may take a few more of your calls on this. I, I like the idea of... I mean, nobody, actually, and this is not... Um, Indicative, I don't think, of, of, of this program. I think it's indicative of the bigger picture. Nobody seems happy. I suppose if you're a Conservative who is comfortable with the way this government is going, um, a, a, a position I find almost impossible to understand in the context of some of the atrocities visited upon British people by government policies, um, either local government or national, you'll just be feeling relief that it wasn't worse. If you're Labour, you'll be feeling disappointed that it wasn't better. Well, I, I don't know quite how... How this works, to be honest, when you do this for a living, because usually we'd be having a right old scrap this morning, and um, I think Lee possibly was the was the caller that best expressed, or, or between us, we best articulated why there isn't an air of, of scrapping in the air. He sees himself very much as a as a conservative, but doesn't feel that Theresa May's government or party speak to him in any meaningful way. Um, cross about the prominence and preferential treatment given as a small businessman to big businesses. Uh, you look at Amazon and Google. Um, problem is, of course, that it was the European Union that was announcing measures to start clamping down on that kind of scenario, and, and we voted to leave that. So who's, who's pleased today? Should we do that for a bit, just to see what happens? Who's really pleased with what happened last night? This is genuinely one of those um, moments where I am not expecting anyone to ring me, so I need to get other questions up on the board as well otherwise I'll have to start singing to you who, who, who is really pleased and I don't mean relieved oh thank god it wasn't worse I mean really pleased 0345 6060973 because if you're a conservative support I mean think back to 95 and Labour put on 1800 gains Right? No one could describe that as anything other than an unmitigated disaster for John Major's administration and fantastic news for the opposition led by Tony Blair. Don't care what you think about John Major or Tony Blair. God, imagine how different the world is now. I mentioned those two names and in many ways they seem to be closer to each other than most of us are to people of different political persuasions in modern Britain. So who's pleased? Because I, I went to vote yesterday... And could not, and I like to think I'm quite a clear thinker and quite well informed politically, you're perfectly entitled to disagree, but I could not conceive of circumstances that would see me jump out of bed with a smile on my face this morning. Because even if the Conservatives got obliterated, that would open the door to them lurching even further to, to the right, going beyond where UKIP were and putting, having a leadership challenge that could conceivably come from Rees Mogg or, of course, Boris Johnson, who... Um, remains poised in the wing with his stiletto unsheathed. So I, I don't know what would have been good news. You kind of wanted a result that would signal a return to um, sensible, modest and moderate politics, looking for things upon which we can all agree. We may need to have Brexit in the rear view mirror before that can even be a possibility, but who, who can genuinely point to a result that would have would have seen them laughing all the way to the to the bank. I suppose if you're a fully paid up member of the momentum wing of the Labour Party, then a massive, massive wins for, for Labour would have been conclusive proof that Jeremy Corbyn was brilliant. Um, and of course, the absence of massive, massive wins for Labour is conclusive proof 
not that Jeremy Corbyn isn't brilliant, but that the mainstream media is biased and smearing him. And um, they were absolutely lovely to Ed Miliband, of course. And the only reason why Jeremy Corbyn isn't king of all he surveys is because of um, pesky journalists. Seven minutes after 11 is the time. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. I'll stay with this for as long as you stay interesting. 0345 60973. We did more on the what would you like to have happened. Let's have a little look now at the why, why do so many of us feel so unrepresented? And talk me through it in, in the manner perhaps of a historian. Why? I mean, it's kind of crept up on us, hasn't it? Unheralded. You've suddenly woken up in the middle of 2018 as someone who's been politically engaged for most of your adult life and there is nobody speaking for you in Parliament. It's quite bizarre. Quite, quite bizarre. 0345 6060 is the number you need. Ben's in Cheam. Ben, what would you like to say? Hi. Uh, I basically woke up really hoping to see... Opposition parties all across London really putting uh, Theresa May's feet to the fire, really. Mm. It's, it's a real shame to wake up and just see we're in the same stalemate that we've been in for the last few years. And why do you think that is? Why, why, why do you think that people were not persuaded to um, vote in their droves for the Labour Party? Well, I mean, it's, it's not just the Labour Party. It's also, I think, while the Liberal Democrats did well in Richmond, there, there was more they could have done elsewhere. Um, but Labour... Yeah, but in, in the context of British politics, a, a, a failing yeah. government normally hemorrhages support to a resurgent opposition. Yeah, exactly. So so why do you think the Labour Party didn't do what you wanted to see them do this morning? Well, I think there's obviously the, there's a stigma around Jeremy Corbyn which is, is just really failed to be addressed. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of detracting away from sort of middle ground voters or swing voters. Um, they, when you say stigma, I, I, what, what, what do you mean? Because the, the, the well, I think it's people have a fear of this resurgent. Well, what, what is being called a resurgent left in a way. Um, I'm not, I don't pick that up. I, 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 I don't pick that up because the policies are very popular. Uh, what I pick yeah, up no, is people look at him and they don't see a stigma. They just see someone they, they think is a bit rubbish. Not, not nothing mean meant by that. Nothing sinister. Nothing um, loaded yeah, no, or smeary. They just look at him and think he's a bit rubbish. Yeah. No. I. I I kind of agree with that, and that's what I kind of see when when you talk to people, I don't know, down the pub, and, and yeah. they say they can't vote Labour, they can't give you a real reason why, um, which is a real shame, and I don't understand where where these votes, why these votes aren't going their way. Um, but you do, you've just explained why. It's because they, 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 they look at him and they don't see someone who they feel inspired or, or particularly... Um, encouraged by. They see someone who they think is a bit yeah. rubbish. And you, you can, I suppose, argue that that's all the fault of the newspapers, but it isn't. It's, it's what they see with their own eyes. Most people don't even read newspapers anymore. They look at Jeremy Corbyn on the rare opportunities that he exposes himself to the public gaze rather than a room full of people who already think he's wonderful, and they see absolutely nothing that, make them, that makes them think this guy could be the one to stop the rot. And that's the mystery. All the people who think there is a rot that needs to be stopped but don't think there's anybody in the game who's in a position to stop it or who has the stones to stop it. It's about charisma and power and leadership, and where is it? I don't know. I feel like kind of the Labour Party within its members have, have kind of an inflated aura at the moment because he obviously drove up membership massively and then won two leadership elections, but they're not being realistic. Um, realistic with, you know, what actually swings elections being the middle, middle, middle swing voters. And, and um, we'd probably allow ourselves to be slightly um, uh, distorted by social media and, and the untraceable accounts and things like that. But when you have, as I do, you know, senior members... Uh, or self-appointed senior members of the kind of momentum aristocracy hurling really astonishing abuse at people. I, I, quite how that was ever going to be a winning electoral strategy. Why don't you F off and join the Tories? You, 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 how is that ever going to win people over? I know, and I think that's something that the, the Labour leadership needs to show. They need to stand up to, to people within their party and say this isn't how we're going to win because they've had... We've now had two lo local elections under Jeremy Corbyn where they've done, well, in my eyes, appallingly. Yes. They lost the, the last one they lost massively, and then this one today. There should have been massive gains across London, especially with the outcome of, say, the Windrush, uh, Windrush effect and then also Grenfell Tower. That was a huge disaster in a Tory council, yet today London is pretty much unchanged. It's ridiculous, and I think the Labour leadership really need to own up to this and start t challenging that. Why, why do you think they don't? Because I, I, I need to start studying the, the sort of the Kremlinology of, of the of the Labour upper ranks because you, you, I'm running out of theories. Even with Occam's razor sharpened to 
to a terrible blade. I can't quite see what the plan is anymore. I used to think, well, they'll sit tight until X happens, or maybe they're waiting for Y to happen. The anti-Semitism stuff lends itself. There's an interview with a woman that runs Momentum in the Times last week that, that lends itself to the theory that they just don't care enough about it, or they're still in denial that it even exists. I think it gets magnified uh, disproportionately by a lot of the right-wing media, but it, to, to pretend that it doesn't exist is just stupid. Well, what's, what's the plan, Ben? I think, but I think one of the key leadership issues at the moment, and I think what everyone is looking for in a leader right now is some leadership on Brexit. And believe it and or why not, won't he provide? Why do you think? Because all we've got is opinions now. I, I, I've given up on ever getting an interview with him. They even pulled out of being interviewed by me when I was presenting Newsnight. So it's, it's not just this studio that they avoid like the flipping plague, and God knows it, why. Even but that, doesn't, doesn't that alone just show like a lack of leadership? Well, it does to me, not, but to the faithful, it shows that I'm really, really biased. And why on earth? would he want to talk to me when I haven't actually been genuflecting before his curious Islingtonian altar for, for most of the last three years? Started off open-minded, presumed we'd get an interview because, you know, uh, it, it was probably quite a warm well, he atmosphere. Needs he needs a platform to stand on and, and people like you should be able to give it to him, but if they're not taking it up and it's because they're not, they're, they're so worried about majorities in, in uh, marginal seats and whatnot, but they're not thinking about the bigger picture of sooner but or even later, that's a plan. Even that, you see, you're saying, oh, the plan is to really focus on majorities in marginal seats. That's not working. No, well, I mean, in the last election, you, you saw some seats, and I, I used to live down in Brighton, you saw yes. a great return in Kent Town and then an increased majority in Hove. So it is working in some areas, but then we, we need to look more national and, and be more inclusive in this debate. Um, and stop focusing on just tiny majorities elsewhere because I think there's a huge part of the electorate right now that can't vote Conservative, yeah. can't vote Labour, yeah. don't believe in the Lib Dems and they need leadership and neither Theresa May nor Jeremy Corbyn are showing any leadership on them, on the issues. Theresa May, keep, as you said most times on the show before, keeps kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. But Jeremy Corbyn is doing the same thing. Yet people are still... They're clinging to the notion that he's the king across the water, he's the great white hope, he's the one that's going to deliver something other than the mess that, that Theresa May is currently presiding over. Yeah, I, it's and, weird. I, do, what do you reckon then, in terms of that, that breakdown, that three-way breakdown, May, Corbyn, neither, I think neither would, would, would knock them both into a cocked hat. Yeah, I mean, you, we've already had a, a caller on earlier today that said that he wished there was a none of the above box mm. on, the, on the ballot. Um, and I kind of, like, I, I am a, a member of the Liberal Democrats, but I am also... I consider myself kind of homeless in a way yes. because I don't see any, any big leadership or any uh, real vision for the country that I want to live in in the future and that I'd want my kids, my grandkids to live in. Um, and it's just a real shame. And I think it's all, a lot of it is this stalemate is brought down to this whole Brexit debate. And I feel like it's, until the leader of the opposition takes a real Brexit stance, a real challenging stance to the, the government in, in currently in, in power, there is going to be no change. That's it. That's where the traction lies, I suspect. I wanted to, to, to avoid uh, seeing everything through the lens of Brexit this morning, because we do it on so many other mornings. But if you look at it as the single most important political um, project that this country has undertaken since the Second World War, the fact that we have two major parties led by people whose personal positions still remain shrouded in mystery and confusion is, is, is pretty close to unbelievable. In fact, it would be unbelievable if it wasn't actually happening. And it was um, a stroke of luck, I suppose, for Theresa May that the elections fell yesterday because we couldn't spend as much time as we would have done um, questioning that three-line whip on the Windrush vote that happened late on Wednesday. Sajid Javid vowing on Monday, of course, as a recently appointed Home Secretary, to leave no stone unturned in his pursuit of the truth regarding that shameful scandal. And by Wednesday, um, voting against a uh, call by the Labour Party to have all documents, um, the ministerial advice on the issue of Windrush, published. So on Monday, it's like a really rubbish Craig David song, isn't it? Made a promise on Monday completely flipping broke it in Parliament on Wednesday. God knows what he'll be doing by Saturday, but on Sunday we made love. 20 minutes after 11 is the time. 0345 973 is the number if you want to join me in a post-mortem of the strangest uh, election of recent times. Certainly, um, for me at least, because I couldn't have told you before I voted what I wanted my vote to achieve. There didn't seem to be any meaningful or realistic possibility of, of what I would like to see politics do next actually being brought about by any of the votes I could have cast. 
I, 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 I'm going to stop apologising for finding Jeremy Corbyn unconvincing. I spent a few months trying to be a little bit more warm and welcoming to people who think he's wonderful. But that distinction between what the public think of his policies and what the public think of him is his fault. Incorrigible FCA reminds us that not everybody will see it like that. It's the media's fault, it's the Blairite's fault, it's Ramona's fault, it's McNichol's fault. That's where we are already. Um, you've missed one out, mate, actually, which is the people who think Labour have done brilliantly. And uh, there are any suggestions that they failed to deliver the, the, the blow to Theresa May that they really should and could have delivered is, is pie-in-the-sky smearing and liberal nonsense. Uh, coming soon, it's the Jewish lobby's fault. I've already seen that, mate. I've already had one saying, well, it can't help much when people like Ruth Smith uh, tell the world that we're a really anti-Semitic party so it's the people complaining about receiving anti-Semitic abuse that are the problem, not the people sending it. You absolute clown trumpet. Uh, Laura Kunzberg over at the BBC will probably get the blame soon um, and so it goes on and uh, one person, Di, has responded to that by reminding Incorrigible FCA that it is also almost certainly my fault. 21 minutes after 11 is the time. Peter's in Liverpool. Peter, what would have, what would have seen you roll out of bed with, a, with an even bigger spring in your step than usual this morning? Yeah, well, I would like to leave it so he's punished for wins rush. I've got to be honest and say, uh, what we've learned from this election is that black people are politically expendable. You can do what you want to black people. You don't want to care. That's quite a quite a grim conclusion and quite a sweeping statement as well. I'm sure there are plenty of people who voted... Don't you think there are plenty of people who voted Conservative who are just as disgusted by Windrush as you and I? You and me? It might be. We don't, we don't care enough. As long as the bins are collected on cheese, you look quite happy. It's, it's, it's terrible to get to Mrs Patel down the road, but at least we've got a low corporation tax. <laughs> That's basically the attitude. I mean, you look at it, see, you, you took the words of mouth when you talk about the three-line whip that was introduced. Oh. introduced yeah. On the eve of this election, now, Windsor has disappeared now completely mm. off the media landscape. Oh, well, no, we didn't talk about it yesterday because it's, it's hard to, to oh. talk about political issues. I've already, I mean, you just said you just yeah, took the well. words out of my mouth and then you said no-one's talking about it. You can't have it both ways, well, pal. Even, but even on, even, on, even on the telly today, I'm talking about... In all fairness, when it comes to Windsor, I think you deserve an award for what you've done because we have been incisive comments on it. Um, you listen to Ian Dale and it's... it's don't, uh, mate, I don't come around your place of work and start slagging off your colleagues. Uh, I, don't, I'm, I'm, I beg, I beg your pardon. You do, there's, one, there's, you one, there's one person who works here you can slag off to your heart's content, but everybody else is decent, yeah. all right? Oh, well, I mean, he's entitled to his view. I yeah. mean, there's, there's no debate about that. But what we've learned, in effect, like you say, Tim, I feel... Is that it doesn't matter what you, the windows just disappeared now. People are yeah, I, I, it, 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 it won't disappear. I've made you that personal promise as well as professional. But the reason why it's possibly not getting the coverage you think it should be getting today is inevitably we're all focusing on the council election. It, 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 I mean, it's, it's box fresh. It happened last night. But even if the Tories had taken a massive pasting yesterday, that could have left the way clear for a, for a leadership bid to be mounted by someone to the right of Theresa May, which admittedly is a much smaller space than I thought it was a year ago, but it, there are still people in her cabinet further to the right than she is, so you could have ended up, you know, bringing that upon the country. You see, you talk, you're having a conversation about people who are feeling politically homeless. Yes. Now, I am, I'm a blue-collar worker, mm. um, left school at 16 and so on and so forth. I'm, my whole family were all blue-collar workers, you know what I mean? Yeah. I am what you would class as the archetypal Labour voter. I've always voted Labour. I voted for Tony Blair three times. Never ever liked him. No. Didn't mind Gordon Brown. I voted for Ed Miliband. Yeah. But Jordan Ed Miliband, I really started getting fed up with Labour. I can remember Stephen Byers coming to Birkenhead, which is just over the water for me. No. And he sold camel heads down the river. He, and a, that was the first pang of doubt I had in the Labour Party. But uh, Corbyn, Corbyn is an antidote to, to that kind of policy. Corbyn would be more interventionist. Well, exactly. But it's the thing is, this is what I'm, what I'm coming to now. Yeah. Chuck and Amuna was, was on the radio, uh, I think it was yesterday, and he seems to do his utmost to put people off voting Labour. And the thing is, for me, is that what, what people like Amuna and Liz Kershaw, I mean, Kendall, I, I keep forgetting their names, she's so instantly forgettable. Go on. But the thing <laughs> is, is, people like that, is what they don't realise is that there's thousands and thousands and thousands of people like me who only vote Labour because of the policies that Corbyn represents. Now, when you say that he, he's not moving up the sharpest knife in the drawer and so on and so forth, he lacks charisma. Well, Tony Blair had charisma. David Cameron had charisma. William Hague had charisma. They showed majestically across the, the world stage. A lot of them walk on corpses. 
Well, William Hague was never prime minister. William Hague was never prime minister. And the, the, the Labour MP that you said that you liked, the Labour, the Labour prime minister you said that you liked, arguably failed at the ballot box precisely because he lacked charisma. Gordon Brown would be the, yeah. the, the, the obvious person. We live in a world, it's not mutually exclusive. I don't, dis I don't disagree with anything you've said, but they're not mutually exclusive. You can be... See, for me, I, this is where I really struggle to understand where all the bile and hatred comes from, from, from the kind of... from the small proportion of Jeremy Corbyn's biggest fans. Because all you're saying is, yeah, I agree, these are brilliant policies. Now imagine how effective the party would be if they were being punted by somebody who, who is just more effective and a bit less rubbish. Well, well that was basically speaking, that was, that was Owen Smith. Owen Smith did it. Owen Smith I, I, Owen I interviewed Smith. him a couple of times and he, mate, he was no... He, he, I know he's a dust dust that channel. He's a washing. He's a washing. He's a washing powder salesman. That's what he is. And that's and really speaking. What, what no, but you're doing it again, to Peter. To you're thinking it's mutually exclusive. You can be charismatic and 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 strong and fleet of thought and f quick thinking and also yeah. believe in uh, renationalization and uh, railways and and utilities and a fairer redistribution of wealth and a shift in national investment away from um enriching shareholders and towards social capital you can build housing you, this is every, loads of people in the labor party would agree with most of those policies they just don't look at the man driving the bus as being possessed of a fully functioning licence. To be fair to Corbyn, the thing is, it, it took Jeremy Corbyn to come along to actually put this back on the agenda. That's the thing, he's really got a bad man as this. I watched the election when, when he first came to power. And I looked, and Andy Burnham's a nice fellow. I've no, I, I, I agree with you again. We're not, I agree, that it did take Jeremy Corbyn to come along and actually make a generation of people realise that we can actually have a quite radical change in how we run this country. It doesn't have to be the cigarette paper distinctions of the of the kind of Blair Cameron paradigm. You you really can start talking about renationalization and you really can start talking about things that I imagine Ed Miliband would have liked to talk about but felt too cowed. And Corbyn's achieved that. So now it's time to move on and, and, and hand over the reins of power to somebody who can deliver what he promises. Uh -huh. If, as long as they believe in it, that's the thing. As long as they believe in it, you see, one of the problems you've they had. Believe in Brexit, Peter. It doesn't mean it's ever going to yeah. be a success. Well, yeah, I give you that. You know what I mean? Brexit's <laughs> not story. But I mean, one of your previous calls, uh, he, he's the captain of his authority, and he was saying about about taxation and so on and so forth. I don't think I, that was Lee. I don't think he fits into any pigeonhole, to be fair. And I, I kind of mean that as a compliment, yeah. uh, even though he may not have realised yeah. it himself. Well, he talk, he talk about, about, about Margaret Thatcher so standing up for, the, um, for entrepreneurism and, mm. stuff and so forth. Margaret Thatcher basically was, was the biggest corporatist that you could, you could ever find. Well, I did I try mean, to explain was, that he, to him. Yeah, but I mean, here's the thing, it boils down to the game, it's style over content. No, but and you're doing it again. Down We're gonna, I'm going to fall out with you on this. You can have style and content. If only, but who's got it? I don't know! There's the problem. I know. He's all supposed to, see, ultimately speaking, here's the thing, right? I would rather have Jeremy Corbyn. I admit, I've got to be honest, he doesn't look like a world, he doesn't look like a statesman, but then not that Mahatma Gandhi. I mean, so the same right, we've answer. covered a lot. We've covered a lot of ground on this one. I think in the history will probably judge Mahatma Gandhi to have achieved rather more during his life than Jeremy Corbyn. But I would well, again, you know, if I'm wrong, Mahatma mate, Gandhi achieved power. No, he didn't want to. But if Mahatma Gandhi did achieve power. That's the thing. Until he achieved power, he actually didn't do an awful lot. I, I, look, I, even I'm not going to rise to this challenge. I, I am not going to. <laughs> I'm not going to allow the defence of Jeremy Corbyn to include comparisons with Mahatma Gandhi. I, the difference is in. <laughs> All right, you can have it. So what does he need to do? Wear a loincloth. I'm vegetarian, but vegetarian. <laughs> Shut up now, you silly man. It's up past 11. <laughs> a lovely call. Thank you, Peter. Uh, 03456060973. This is just weird I, and, 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 and a bit odd. There's no ding-dongs today, there's no, because everybody kind of feels the same. And unless, and I, I appreciate it, if you're a massive racist reactionary, you're probably not going to ring me because you don't want to end up with four million people clicking on you all over Facebook. So apart from them, um, and, and they'll all be sort of pleasuring each other in the old box of trolls, I'm sure. So apart from them, everybody is just a little bit meh. Why? I don't know. Do you? I, I just noticed Ken Livingston is trending on Twitter. Um, has he been on telly talking about Hitler? Please, God, no. I, I, 
I just can't think why else he would be trending today. Done a little bit of post-election analysis, been asked a question about Hitler and didn't say, no, 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 I'm not here to talk about it. Let's talk about the elections. He can't have done it again. We'll find out. In the meantime, a bunch of questions today. I'm really, really enjoying this. I really enjoy... Well, I enjoy work every day, but yesterday was great fun because we just sort of had a bit of a day off. It was a bit like a home clothes show yesterday. I don't know if you were listening. You know, when the weather's nice and teacher says, so should we do it outside today? And you'll go, yeah, because you'll just doss about for the duration. Yes. Yesterday we talked mostly about dating and then haggling with undertakers and then we had mystery hour and we had a lovely time. And today's nice as well. I think because, and I can't do this every day, otherwise they'd, they'd have me my sandwiches wrapped in a roadmap by tea time. But it's quite nice not to be defending a, a citadel. It's quite nice not to be on a bridge with my trusty sword trying to slay everyone who wants to get across it. It's quite nice to admit. I just don't know at the moment. I just don't know. I'm pretty clear on Brexit being a bad idea. I'm also perfectly happy to, to accept that you still don't realise that. And maybe I'll end up being wrong about that. Maybe you can have a, a hard border. Um, uh, maybe you can leave the customs union without having a hard border in Ireland. It just seems currently impossible to me. Um, not to mention all the other stuff. But on, on, the, on the political, the bigger political question of representation... I think you could be uh, possessed of profoundly different ideals and priorities and politics from mine and also feel profoundly unrepresented. Most obviously via Brexit, I suppose, because the party of Ken Clark and, and Anna Soubry and others it is simply not the party of Theresa May and David Davis and others, and yet, of course, the banner remains the same. Similarly, I think we'll talk to Chuck Ramona because Peter in Liverpool just mentioned him. We'll talk to him in about 10 minutes. Um, similarly, the Labour Party of Chuck Ramona does not seem to me to bear much resemblance to the Labour Party of Jeremy Corbyn. And the divisions, Philip Collins has written a brilliant piece in The Times today, um, which you should have a look at if you get the chance, because he's just, I think, pushing the door open on something that will become increasingly clear over the next two or three years. And something we've hinted at on here as well on this program the traditional divisions of, of of political party loyalty in this country are shifting and they're, they're moving away from economics and moving more towards what you describe as sensibilities so uh, the statistics back him up on on brexit being representative of broader world views you know not just immigration, but even femi if, if, you, if you're uncomfortable with feminism you're more likely to have voted to leave the European Union. Um, which is quite weird because, you know, you're, you're also more likely to consider Margaret Thatcher to be the best thing since sliced bread. It's, it's an odd little thing, but it's an article well worth reading. I'll tweet it for you, but I think it's probably behind a paywall. You get a couple free if you register with the Times, but um, uh, it, obviously you may not want to do that. You could just go to the library. Gary's in Tooting. Gary, Back to the results overnight. What would have seen you wake up with a very big smile on your face? Bearing in mind, I'm talking about the elections. Well, what would have done that was to have seen young people voting in the same kind of numbers that older people vote. Because democracy relies on a checks and balances. It relies on interest groups defending their interests and politicians responding to them. And I think that older people, and I'm one of them... How, how old are you? 54. All right. I don't, you, do you count as older? Well, I think I do. Well, when, you're older than a young person, but I don't think you're right. old. Yeah, but it, it, pension kicks in at 55. We want our final salary pension schemes with our tax-free sums, thank you very much. Yes. And our property prices to keep going up. We right. want our social care paid for. We no, want, no inheritance tax, please. So we want no inheritance tax. And we, we want all of that. And we want it largely cost-free. And, of course, not me, but large numbers of us want Brexit as well. Yes. And so we get fed older. stuff. You know, we get we get stroked by the uh, by the politicians. Mm -hmm. And the younger people and I'm gonna put this in a in a I hope a, a, a broader context. And I'm not saying all of them by any means, but there are there's certainly a large number. Um they they grew up with the with the tyranny of choice. Yes. They, because this massive choice uh, out there and this constant noise that's there, different explanations, and they'll find something that they don't like about Corbyn or they'll find something that Ken has said on the outer fringes of, of craziness. I don't say, well, I'm not going to vote for him yes. and I'm not going to vote for that. And do you think, and you've done your political history, James, do you mm. think 
that um, that James Callahan and Margaret Thatcher, or especially Ted Heath on his yacht, do you think he was like Francis Drake with with thousands of ships behind him sailing uh, into the new future? Do you think Harold Wilson was like Spartacus standing on the hill with millions behind him? No, people were just making a pragmatic choice. Yes. They thought, well... I, I, I think I'm following you. Is, ...is better than the alternatives that are there, uh, uh, that are elsewhere. And just because I don't agree with all of it doesn't mean to say I'm going to spoil my paper or I'm not going to bother to vote. No, for it's more that I think you're being unfair to people who would like to believe more in Jeremy Corbyn. Because also the, 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 the examples you've provided, if we look at the Labour ones rather than the Conservative ones... <laughs> Um, uh, Jim Callaghan and, and, and Harold Wilson were really effective operators. Wilson in particular, mate, could connect with the public in a way that arguably no Labour leader since has managed to, you know. The, 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 there, there are optics here. I know people hate it, and I understand why. And I think the, the most damning indictment of, of where style now fits into the equation is probably the almost irresistible observation that Winston Churchill would really struggle to become Prime Minister in the current climate of style and substance, uh, uh, often drunk, incredibly grumpy, very fat, um, uh, not great telly. I don't think he would have um, won an election if it was in the 21st century, unless he had the best, you know, spin doctors and stylists and what have you. But that's it's not, it's not... It goes to win earlier. Yeah, you might be right, but it's... Much of a surprise. But, but Corbyn lives in the same world that we live in. He doesn't live in the world that Harold Wilson lives in. He doesn't live in the world that Ted Heath lives in. He lives in a world that saw America elect, uh, a, a, you know, a game show host. He lives in a world that saw Tony Blair get a free pass on an awful lot of dodgy politics simply because he was quite fresh-faced and, and, and shiny. Uh, he lives. Jeremy Corbyn lives in a world where you need to play the game to win it, and his refusal to play the game is utterly, utterly compelling. I get it. I completely get it. That refusal to play the game. If you had told me two or three years ago that a major political party in this country would just stick their middle finger up at the Daily Mail and Rupert Murdoch, I would have. I would have not being able to imagine circumstances in which I wouldn't run into the polling booth to vote for them. Just for that one thing alone. When they when they maligned Ed Miliband's dead father in the Daily Mail, his dead dad in the Daily Mail in an attempt to try to undermine Ed Miliband. That, that to me, taught me something about the country I call home, the only country I've ever called home that I never wanted to learn. Just about those impulses. So I, I would absolutely recognise that there are elements of the Corbyn appeal that are magical and magnificent but there aren't enough of them mate and it's not right to say oh you've just got to vote for the least bad option because I look at what's happening to this country and I don't understand why the opposition isn't 20 or 30 points ahead in the polls and overnight I just don't get it and the only answer is Corbyn well, I, I agree to a large extent with what you're saying, but I want to come back to perhaps a couple of other points, which is that I think oppositions lose elections much more than... Uh, sorry, um, governments lose elections much more than oppositions win them. A kind of fatigue and an over-familiarity overtakes people, mm. and, and therefore governments are voted out more often than oppositions are, are voted in. And I understand that's a spectrum, but... Maybe, you know, if the, if the Tories manage to keep changing leaders and so on and manage to keep looking in some way fresh, even if it's not completely fresh, then maybe they'll be able to, to pull that rabbit out of a hat again. I don't know. But there's, there's, a, there's an element of tiring. So I think that some oppositions inherit their, uh, their successes. Yes, but, but, but how... I mean, if you just left... I, I, I think Corbyn is a, is a force for negativity. I think if, if if we didn't know who the leader of the Labour Party was, the Labour Party would have done better. Look at what the government is presiding over. It's it's quite incredibly bad. Whether or not you think it, it, it veers into evil is a matter of personal opinion, but objectively, the single biggest political project of our lifetimes is still mired in confusion, ignorance and infighting. And the responsibility for that lies squarely at the feet of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet. And, the, and the, I, I, looking at the numbers, it's getting worse, actually, as more, more results are posted. They haven't landed a punch, mate, overnight. And that there is only one man responsible for that. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to deny much of what you're saying, but I'll come back with another element from the historical or perhaps cultural perspective. Yeah. And you'll know this, is that political vacuums are dangerous things oh, to allow. Oh, God, yes. Very dangerous. And, 
I have to say, James, if you're coming on day after day and saying, I've got no political home, I'm, I've got nothing to vote for, you do go and vote, and that's what you said you did yesterday, and yes. on I, you for doing this. I do it not least as an honour to those who come before yes, me to allow the likes of me to vote, so I'm always going to do it. But political vacuums are dangerous, and while this mood music plays on, and of course the Russian bots have got something to do with this, with, with undermining the whole idea of democratic processes, undermining politicians, undermining what these, these things go on, because a little chaos helps, helps yeah, them. Yeah. You want to be careful about doing the work of that, because you've got to be careful what we reap here, by poking and poking and poking the wasp's nest and saying they're all as bad as each other, it's not worth voting for anybody. And young people No, say, but, uh, but people oh, aren't I'm doing that. Yeah, but no, I, listen, I know, that, I know that we're having a good toing and a throwing, um, but, but, but I'm not, but that isn't what's happening. What, what people like me are saying is these are brilliant policies and it is incredible that Jeremy Corbyn has managed to move them into the mainstream contemplation so that we now talk with a straight face about renationalizing the railways or um, uh, insisting that business invest more in the workforce as opposed to the shareholders it's 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 a thing of beauty and he deserves enormous credit for it but the next stage needs a different driver it's not saying they're all as bad as each other quite the opposite my friend it's saying here is a platform of policies that are as close to what you'd call social democracy and according to the Scandinavian model as we have seen in my lifetime. Of course the vested interests are going to try and malign them as communist and socialist, but that's where he becomes the problem because he should be sitting here now, not here, but in, in every studio, in every news organisation in the country and unpicking the unfair treatment. He should be tackling head-on the portrayal of his policies as being somehow communistic or, um, or dangerous. He should be winning the battles on the battlefield where elections are won, not on the battlefield where backs are patted and I don't know what they have when they're celebrating. Sparkling carrot juice is raised towards the rafters and everybody toasts each other on being so right on and wonderful. That's the point. They're not the same. They're not as bad as each other. The Labour Party's platform of policies is infinitely better for ordinary people in this country. The media will remain dedicated to convincing them that it isn't. And the only man who can break that, or woman, is the leader of the Labour Party. And the one that we've got is not doing it. Why don't you run, James? I'd run through brick walls for you. Thank you, George. A little bit of love on Twitter. How desperately unfashionable. Um, uh, we shall see. One day, maybe. I doubt it, though. Um, Chukramuna would be a much better person, perhaps, around whom some of the disaffected Labour support could gather. It certainly almost came to pass. Um, and he remains one of the prominent Labour politicians, speaking out increasingly against the madness of Brexit. He joins me live on the line now. What happened to the surge, Chuka? Well, um, I think that's a good question. Uh, I think we've got to be grown up in our analysis of what has happened in the local elections. Obviously, we've still got results coming in, including my own in Lambeth. Um, but look, neither major party can treat these results as any kind of endorsement. It's a mixed picture. And given that Brexit is the biggest issue of the moment, you just mentioned it, clearly this is not a sign that the country is coming behind and coming together. Uh, behind the Prime Minister's hard Brexit plan or the alternative that Labour is offering, frankly. And all that we do know is that the most anti-Brexit parties actually have seen a moderate revival and the most pro-Brexit party, UKIP, was decimated, having got almost 4 million votes in 2015. Yes, but they have re retained overall control of the Conservative Party, so they're not going to be that upset, are they? Well, you could say that. That is a point of view um, that some might say is very valid. But I think, I, I, I mean, from a Labour point of view, I think there's got to be a proper post-mortem on what's happened here. I think the National Executive Committee of the party should appoint somebody to do an investigation because given how divided and incompetent the government is at present, how badly the Brexit negotiations are going, as you illustrate on your shows every single week, uh, weak uh, economic growth figures, poor public services, a Windrush generation scandal, um, you would have expected Labour to do far better. And there was an expectation that we would make gains in Wandsworth and Kensington and take those two councils, having got MPs there for mm. the first time in uh, one case um, in a long time. That didn't happen. And then, of course, we lost Barnet and we didn't win Westminster, which were also being talked up as well. Can I show you 
why part and you you probably know this already but it might be illustrative for others I, I, i'll show you partly by asking you one question why people do get disillusioned more broadly with the whole landscape at the moment because you, you you've not been backwards in coming forwards about your opposition to brexit it puts you at odds with the party leadership if you had a front bench position and you called for a second referendum you, you could lose it as um as owen smith did recently but if i say to you if you were leader of the labor party what would your brexit policy be you won't answer me well p personally if I, I i want the party not only to uh, come in behind the single market because frankly you need to be part of the single market and the customs union to avoid a hard border in Northern Ireland but frankly clearly there's not going to be a consensus in Parliament on this issue of Brexit and the Brexit deal and that's why I think we should have a people's vote on the Brexit deal personally I and, it, and if you were leader the... of the Labour Party you would be calling now publicly for a second referendum I'd be calling for a people's vote on the Brexit deal with the option to remain in absolutely so I mean, when you say people vote you mean a second referendum but obviously the market research has shown you that people respond more favorably to it being called a people's well, vote than well, a second referendum <laughs> well technically speaking it would be the third such national poll on the eu yeah. issues since the 1970s but it would be the first one on the brexit deal oh look essentially in 2016 um we had a a poll on whether or not to start the process of withdrawal. Parliament um, uh, acted in accordance with that poll, which was for the Brexit process to start. Article 50 was in vote. But the Brexit deal is an altogether different issue. And frankly, my view is, is that in 2016, if you like, Britain put in an offer on the Brexit House, and now it's doing the survey to find out whether there are solid foundations. And you know, if you get a bad survey back on a House purchase, you don't press on exchange complete uh, and go forward with the transaction. You, 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 you take a different view because you know much more about the house and than just seeing the fancy picture on the website. And of course, uh, the, the informed or the level of informedness that an electorate demonstrates, um, thus democracy is enhanced. But, but that, that's on the horizon. Let's look in the rearview mirror briefly. Why, why do you think, as a, as a campaigning Labour MP, the leader is? is not keener on, on getting out there and trying to win over the hearts and minds of, of the centrist voters. This is one of my listeners has sent this question in. The centrist voters he so desperately needs. Because uh, you must find it frustrating, and, and presumably the more frustrating it is, the more effort you put into trying to understand why it is. Why, why is the leader not out there trying to win over the, 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 the kind of floating voters mm. that, that you need to win elections? Well, I, 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 I'm not sure I totally um, shared the, the same interpretation, but I, I know what you're saying, and that's one of the reasons why I say I think that the NEC should commission a proper investigation as to what happened here. Because the problem that we had after the general election is Labour didn't win. We weren't in office. Tory rule continued. And yet the result, because expectations were so low, was treated as if somehow we had won an election that we had lost. And then there wasn't a proper post-mortem afterwards as to why was it we, di we didn't get the extra 66-odd seats that we need to form a majority when we saw the Conservative Party condu conduct perhaps the worst general election campaign I've seen um, one of the main parties conduct in my, my lifetime. That post-mortem didn't happen last year, and my gosh, I think it should happen now if we're serious about forming a majority. And, and frankly, I mean, I think this is a challenge for both the major parties. I think British politics is kind of broken at the moment. Um, uh, neither party seems capable at the moment of forming a large enough and broad enough coalition of support to be able to uh, govern in a you know clear and confident way and ultimately I don't think that and, and why do I think that is I think mm. partly because I just don't think the British public are ideological really I mean I, I, I you know you look at the Tory party it's been taken over by right-wing ideologues who are you know, intent on pursuing a Brexit that, frankly, there's not a majority for in the House of Commons. Um, and there is a danger that we can get ideological about things. And I think people are often quite suspicious of um, an offer where you presume to have known the answers to a problem long before the problem arose. Um, and that is... That, that I think there's a lesson in there for all of us. And I also just think the fulcrum around which politics plays out in 2018 and probably will do so in the future has changed. It's not just a straightforward left-right um, battle. Um, but there the is choices, 
Weirdly. Well, yes, but it's that, almost like the choice has to yeah. catch up with the reality. Well, th that's absolutely right, because I think, you know, there's clear what, you know, Brexit was not a cause of these things, but it was symptomatic. It illustrated that, you know, there are differences in view between those who take an internationalist view and those who take a more nationalist view um, on social issues. Some people are more conservative, others are more liberal. And I think, you know, just those two other factors alone, beyond the left-right mm. split that we're used to, are asserting themselves much more in British politics. Now, you know, Westminster can carry on like none of this change is going on, um, but I just don't think it's terribly sustainable. So, in some senses, both the general election and these local elections are a massive wake-up call, but is, is, are, are the establishments in each of the parties going to bother listening? That's a crucial question. Only time will tell. Finally, Chukka Ramona, do you think British politics could accommodate a, a, a kind of um, Anglo-Saxon Emmanuel Macron? Do, 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 you, do you sense... Because what you've just described does suggest the door would be open for quite a radical... Um, intervention. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say, I mean, there's a lot of talk about um, that, and I, I you know, uh, I, I'm a fan of Emmanuel Macron. I know, I've known him uh, quite well over the last few years. Um, I got to know him when I was in the shadow cabinet, but I think Britain needs something that's appropriate for Britain, and uh, we definitely know our politics is broken, so let's fix it in the British way. Chukra Mona, many thanks indeed. 11.59 is the time. I